I hope when we use the word spirituality, you and I have the same implications or the connotation of the word. Spirituality for me implies a science of life explaining to us the nature of ultimate reality, explaining to us the essence of our being and the relationship of every expression of life to the totality of life. That is spirituality as far as I can understand the word. Now we are here this evening to go into the issue of women and spirituality. <coughs> Do we recognize that women have to play a different role in the civilization, in the evolution of universal life, than men? If yes, what is that role? And why has the woman to play a different role? If the women have become aware that they have to play a significant role in the world today, I'll be happy if that awareness is born in the hearts of women. There is not only the difference and distinction as the male and the female, but there is a difference and a distinction in the psychological structure, the difference and distinction which accompanies the functional roles that the men and women have to play in social life. If a woman is not ashamed that she is a woman, if she is not ashamed of motherhood, which is in her very blood, whether she marries and gives birth to children or she does not, is immaterial, but the motherhood is there to contain a child in one's own body, for nine months is not an insignificant event in the life of a woman as a member of society, nourishing another life out of one's own flesh and blood, out of one's own vitality. So there comes a different power to contain, to hold, to nourish at the cost of one's life. There comes about a tenderness in the very chemistry of the body. Do we recognize all that? That when a woman accepts the glory of motherhood, she is accepting voluntarily a different role not only for the family, not only in a man and woman relationship, but towards the future of the society. If we accept that, then we proceed further. Whether the motherhood materializes and you actually give birth to children, or you do not, this possibility 
and this capacity for motherhood is there in the very structure. With motherhood comes love as a motivation. I'm afraid that we will have to go into the fundamentals very briefly and I am apprehensive that my approach will be perhaps strange and unusual for you. A person coming from a different part of the world, you will think. But irrespective of the East and the West, irrespective of the Indian culture or heritage, I'm sharing with you at the cost of being misunderstood something very fundamental. I feel that the, the woman has the capacity, tremendous capacity for love, for tenderness, for containing and nourishing life with some sacrifice, willingly gone through without a grudge, And the world is starving for love, compassion, tenderness. This whole civilization today is based upon the male qualities of assertion, <coughs> aggression, which is natural to a man because of the functional role he has been playing as a head of the family, as a member of society, as a member of army, navy, air force, as the ruler, the administrator, and so on and so forth. Thousands of years men have played the role. So there is an assertive psychology in the very blood, the assertion, the aggression, competition is there. And this civilization is based upon those values. If the women can supply <coughs> different motivations to the present society, social motivations, not personal virtues and talents, but love as a social motivation, the willingness to sacrifice as a social motivation, to contain and to hold, to accept others as they are, as the mothers accept their children, and love them for what they are. It's a very, it's a very rare strength that comes with this woman's body. So do we recognize all that? Woman has fought for her equality with men and she has become an equal member in society by constitutions, the laws of the country and she has achieved political and economic equality. That's very good. But after acquiring the freedom and the equality, if we are going to copy and imitate, if we are going to accept the value structure that the men have created for the whole of life, then we will not be able to contribute anything to this aggression and violence-ridden culture, this war-ridden society the human race, we will not be able to contribute anything if we accept the value structures that men have created, whether it is economy, politics, culture, education. Can the women pose a challenge today by asserting themselves to the existing political, economic and educational <coughs> systems and stand up for Economy for peace, love and freedom. Politics for peace, freedom, 
and love, education for freedom. Can they replace the motivation of assertion by receptivity? Can they replace the policy and the motivation, the incentive for competition and confrontation by cooperation and friendship? Can they replace this value of dividing human race into nations, ideological groups, and religious and racial groups by the motivation of one global human family? So, there are very fundamental and crucial challenges waiting for us after having acquired the equality. But if we just want to imitate and copy the men, earn as, as they run after money and power, if we accept their definitions of power and that domination, that desire to own, to possess, then I think we will not be able to help solve the problems that the men have failed to solve in the last thousands of years or hundreds of years or the last 50 years in the world. That's my very humble submission to you. Now let us turn to spirituality. <coughs> because of the inborn sensitivity that exists in the female body. A woman, I think, if the men will excuse me, a woman has a more sensitive body than the men has, the man has. More evolved in sensitivity. Every pore of her being can throb with sensitivity. It's there. She has the talent of receptivity, not only biologically, psychologically. The power of receptivity. Those who have been asserting and have been aggressive get benumbed. They cannot receive. In order to receive, to listen, to look, you need a different kind of sensitivity, which we have. If we become aware of that. So that sensitivity, that capacity for receptivity, and that tenderness which comes to the body and the heart because of motherhood, I think women are more susceptible to the spiritual approach than the unfortunate men are. You might have heard the name of Mahatma Gandhi and Gandhiji used to say, I have heard it from my father who worked with Gandhi, Gandhiji used to say to his colleagues, the men, if you want to get liberated, you will have to be born as a woman. <laughs> you, you won't understand what love is <coughs> and the sorrow that goes with love. And to lift that love and sorrow, you will have to be born in a female body, in a woman's body. He used to say that. And I, I appreciate the sensitivity which must have made Gandhiji utter those words. So women are more susceptible to the things that are non-rational. Please do listen rather carefully. Intellectually, as soon as women get the chance, they can develop their intellects and brains and compete with men. 
men have been doing it so it becomes it comes easily to them and it becomes rather difficult for a woman to acquire all that knowledge contain it retain it it's a cerebral strain for her but women have proved it even in the field of nuclear physics and you know science and mathematics all other subjects but life is not only the biological and the psychological aspect there is a non rational aspect of life which only the sensitivity can feel and of which only intelligence can be aware <coughs> the intellect is not gifted with this faculty of awareness it can move and acquire knowledge those dead ideas from the past can deal with memory scholarship erudition which all deals with the past so there is a non rational aspect of life and i think women can deal with it through their feel and sensitivity that's why they may be more susceptible to spirituality but because of their sensitivity they are also susceptible to sentimentalism and romantic ideas about spirituality and they can be misled very easily <laughs> sustained intellectual effort sustained serious contemplation and reflection does not come very easily to all of us most of us indulge in emotions sentimentality so there are there is an asset but if it is not handled properly it can create distortion and perversion also if we have looked at this background let us proceed further so now a woman who is alert and sensitive is not going to give in to sentimentality or emotional fuss she is not going to look around for teachers masters or gurus for her emotional needs but she is really looking for the meaning of life she is looking for the wholeness of life within her and around her there may be emotional needs for support consolation there will be an emotional need for belonging somewhere but spirituality is not for psychological rehabilitation it's a field of total revolution it's a field of growing into a different dimension of consciousness you cannot play around with spirituality casually or lightly if i need i feel lonely i am weak i get disturbed and upset and i need some psychological or emotional solace and there may be ashrams where i go and find places that suit my or that are agreeable to my temperamental idiosyncrasies and i go and stay there one can understand that but that's not spirituality if i'm seeking for some emotional experiences waking up kundalini's shakti path transmission of this that and experiences i may go in for that but that has nothing to do with spirituality which is transcending the frontiers of brain and mind transcending the frontiers of i consciousness and growing into a different dimension of consciousness where there will be no ego at the center and there will be no circumference <coughs> as experience and memory so if women are aware of that and they are re really looking for spirituality and not for new fields of attachment i do not want to get attached to my husband wife boyfriend girlfriend and i go and get attached to someone and my guru or teacher or master it's a new field for attachment attachment doesn't become holy because it is in the four walls of an ashram or a monastery 
it is unholy wherever it is because attachment prevents love and attachment creates bondage so if women are really looking for spirituality then let us proceed most of us look for something else we believe that we want spirituality we want freedom spirituality the essence of spirituality is freedom well either you belong to the whole of life or you belong nowhere and are you aware my dear friends that with freedom there comes about insecurity freedom is vulnerability to life a voluntary vulnerability so you become vulnerable to the events of life the challenges of life and if women have been living protected by men protected by families protected by legislation by society would they really care for freedom this inner freedom where you become essential i insecure vulnerable and self reliant do we want that i hope i do not discourage you <laughs> but i have i have come from a very far away country and i look upon every meeting as the last meeting if we do not meet again <coughs> then in this meeting i should give you the depth of my understanding the i must share my life blood with my women friends here sitting even if it feels like a discouragement so do we want that spirituality do we mean by the word spirituality this unconditional freedom if women can become free of this acquisitive i consciousness this i consciousness this ego which always trembles with the idea of fear because it wants to be secure it wants to be protected if they want that and if they can allow that inner freedom to happen in them well they will recreate the whole world with a gusto with an with a with an energy unprecedented in human history because it is only a free individual that can love it's a free individual that has banished all authority from his or her life <coughs> that will never try to enslave anyone else never try to own or possess anyone else now supposing all of us do want that we presume that the present company has an urge for that unconditional and total freedom and they are working on themselves for that they are meditating they are educating themselves they are refining and making their physical structure more and more sensitive etc etc we presume that then you ask me how do you relate this inner voyage this inner exploration when we are married have family of children how do we relate that this inner process of self education and refinement with our daily life now please do see that what we call daily life is the only life available to us <laughs> there is no other life <laughs> high up in the skies in the name of heavens or somewhere down in the hell if there is any heaven or hell it is on this earth 
not away from us, not away from today, but the totality of life, the eternity, the infinity is here in what you call daily life and living. <coughs> Either we meet it or we miss it. So daily living is, is the only life where you can meet the eternity, the infinity, be with it, be in it, move out of it. And relationships are opportunities for self-discovery. One can exist in isolation. But self-discovery requires the movement of relationships. In the movement of relationship, you get reflected. The factual content of yourself gets reflected in that movement. If you are alone, you can cultivate talents. You can stimulate powers, physical or mental. You can bring about change in the periphery of your life. But growth requires the movement of relationship. So please do not think that these responsibilities of going through relationship are obstacles. If you look upon relationships and the responsibility as obstacles, then you will try to run away from them and create a different set of circumstances and a different field of activity in the name of religion or spirituality. And then there will be a split. This is my family life. These are my children, this is my husband or whatever, boy, boyfriend, whatever it is. And here I cannot live spirituality and there, when I go to some place, that is the place to live spirituality. We cannot create a dichotomy between spirituality and daily living. If spirituality cannot be lived in daily relationships, at least for me, it has no value whatsoever. So, the daily living, the daily life is the only life we have and relationships are not obstacles. If you live in isolation in some cave and then you say you are free and then you say you are at peace with yourself, You may be nourishing illusions. If your peace can breathe freely in the movement of relationships, when confronted with challenge, if that peace is not disturbed, then it has some life. Otherwise, in the cave, in the monastery, in isolation, you will have dead peace. It, wo it won't have any life. And freedom that gets damaged by the interaction with human beings, with interaction in non-human species, it is so delicate that glass with care do not disturb my freedom. If we have to say that, then that freedom is not worth having. Freedom is a dimension. Peace is a dimension of consciousness. Enlightenment or whatever you call it is a dimension of consciousness. You grow into it and there is no lapsing back from that. Nothing can break it. So, now women have the responsibility to live in family, raise children, take care of them, <coughs> or their jobs to do. So, how do they proceed? We have discovered two things, that relationships are not obstacles, that they are opportunities. And we discover ourselves only through the movement of relationship. And we have discovered, if you have accompanied me, that daily li living is the only field in which we can meet the eternity of life. Now I have accepted, <coughs> supposing I have accepted married life voluntarily, knowing full well 
what it is to get married or to have a family. I have accepted the limitations. Every security brings with it restriction on freedom and a limitation in the field of action. So, for whatever reasons, I have accepted that voluntarily. So, when the responsibilities come, I will not have a grudge against the family, against the children, against the life partner. You know, people feel very, very enthusiastic before they accept responsibilities. And once they accept, and the romance with the newness fades away, then the responsibility uh, seems like an ordeal. It seems like a burden. The romance fades away. The security is taken for granted. So I do think that spiritual inquirer will have the maturity not to create a grudge out of the challenges that married life or motherhood bring to them. They will need two things, they will need, they will require two things for doing this. One is a firmness, to stand firm in one's own understanding, not to compromise the understanding, and the pliability to give in in details of daily life. Please do see, they are two, these two things can constitute a strength and integrity in a person. One stands firm in the fundamentals of life, no compromise on that. But when it comes to details of life, which clothes to wear, when to have meals, when to sit down in silence, when to do your yoga exercises, uh, when to go out when you want it, you know, <laughs> these details of life, if one does not become adamant and obstinate about the details, then there is great fun in living. But what happens is, we become very obstinate and adamant about details of life. I want to do this at seven o'clock in the morning, and the circumstances in the family do not allow me to do it at seven, they allow me to do it at eight. And then I create a big issue. I wanted to do it at seven. And now look, because I have family and children, I have to do it at nine o'clock. Facts get converted because I wanted it. I wanted to do it at seven. And I can do it only at nine o'clock or eleven o'clock. <coughs> we create an issue out of that. Now, if we, go, if we create issues out of it, in the name of spiritual inquiry, then there will be no end to misery. Because every day, with growing children, there will be demands. And their demands, their demands will make me conscious of the nature of my reactions towards them. The children do not create attachment. I get attached to them, and then I feel guilty that I am attached to them, and therefore I feel irritated with them when I notice my attachment. <laughs> please do see this. Please do see this. This is how the mind works. So two things I said, firm in fundamentals, not to give in, even though it's a mother, if the father wants to impose or dominate just because she is a mother, then the woman has to have the strength and courage to resist such domination, such position, and stand 
as an independent individual. But the details of life, I cannot go into all the details, but we don't know how to move into, in, through these details and that creates misery. Those who do not have families and those who live alone, they have their problems also, the women. Then they want to be free, they want to have jobs, they live on their own, and there's a romantic idea of freedom and living alone, and that aloneness fades away and it gets replaced by a sense of loneliness. A couple of years, a few years, and then the sense of loneliness. Here there is the <coughs> possibility of getting attached to or becoming dependent upon, and there is the fear of loneliness, and then clinging to someone or other. So, what I'm trying to say is, in the family life, when these reactions are expressed, family is a school, family life is a school, it's a joint adventure of a man and a woman. It's the first school where children are educated. Do you know when the education of the child begins? It begins at the moment of conception. The attitude of the man and the woman. If there is aggressiveness, there is hatred, there is lust, there is sadism, or there is cynicism, in the mind of one of the partners, the quality of the consciousness of child gets determined to a very great extent at the moment of conception. And those who are engaged in the science of genetics will tell you all this. These facts have been now noticed by people who are interested in genetic engineering, social engineering. So both have problems, whether one gets married and has a family, one does not get married and live with someone. Everybody has the problem. So if you can look upon every relationship as an opportunity to discover oneself, take notice of the quality of reactions, understand why those reactions are there, then the more the relationships, the quicker is the discovery. Because you are exposed all the time to the searchlight of those intimate relationships. And you discover all your angles and angularities, peculiarities very quickly. I hope I am not going astray and uh, relating my communication to your questions. <coughs> now how do I relate, how do I express my inner understanding in my life, in my relationships with people? First play, does understanding, no, even prior to that, are we aware of the difference between knowledge and understanding? I read a book, I acquire knowledge about something, I store it in memory, and then I reproduce it when I feel the necessity of it. Knowledge can never become the substance of life. It's a dead burden that we carry. It is useful, it is required for dealing with technology, with science, on the material level, but knowledge is sterile, it has no dynamism. And we are used to acquiring knowledge and using it intentionally, with an effort. Now, is understanding just like knowledge? that you acquire, and then it gets transferred to your memory, and then you have to make an effort, recollect it, 
and reproduce it or use it or apply it or, under or is understanding something different. It seems to me that understanding is something very different qualitatively. It is born of interaction between life and yourself, these relationships, the movement of relationship and the action interaction that takes place between life and yourself. If you stand there with life without any inhibition, without any reservation, then the, out of that interaction understanding blossoms and it is the substance, it is, it is a part and parcel of your life. It doesn't get transferred to memory. You take your meals and you digest food, it gets converted into flesh and blood and tissues and nerves. And you do not have to carry it separately. I am carrying my food in the stomach. You don't have to. You eat it, you digest it, and it is you. So the understanding is there. It is you. You are the lamp of understanding. The light of understanding burns in your life then. So, when I understand, maybe I discover tiny bits of truth, facts about myself, facts about life, facts about the wholeness of life, if I discover and understand, then do I have to worry about expressing it and communicating it with others? Do I have to make plans? I have understood this. Now let me have the know-how of how to take it to other people and convince them. It's a dynamic force. In spite of you, it is going to express through your whole being. Even you will not be able to withhold that force of understanding. It's a very dynamic force, very explosive force. Whatever you do, whether you scrub the floor, wash the clothes, cook the meals, talk to your children, that light of understanding, that clarity of understanding will shine through whatever you do. It will bring a breath of fresh air into the surroundings where people are still dealing with the past, with the dead knowledge and so on. So one doesn't have to worry about how the inner understanding will be expressed in daily relationship. It will find its own ways of expressing. If you are a poet, you have a poetic nature, through the lines that get composed, the light of understanding will shine. If you are an artist, if you are a musician, through your notes, the truth will vibrate. You cannot cover it up once it is there. But supposing we would like to sit in meditation for 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, and the responsibilities of the family do not <coughs> allow me to do it, what do I do? I have an urge <coughs> to, to dedicate myself. I'm not satisfied with just an hour or two a day and I would like to devote, dedicate. Then I think the woman has every right to talk to her partner. If the children are not too young, if they can be taken care of by the father, then she has every right to discuss with the partner and say that I cannot hold my urge back. I have to go. Let me make intensive efforts at self-education or a deep plunge into meditation, say for six months, nine months. I'll come back, but I can't hold back this urge. It's an irresistible urge. Then I think she has the right. 
she's entitled to discuss those things. If the urge is there, genuine urge, my friends, you shall see for yourselves. Excuse me for using this language, but that's what I have seen in my life. That when the urge is genuine, the external circumstances become favorable to you. They become agreeable, they become favorable. This favorableness of the circumstances is the grace of life that descends upon you. Divinity doesn't come in some personal form and say, here I am going to confer my grace upon you. You even do not know when the grace descends upon you. But you see the indications in the see the indications in the favorableness of circumstances. It's an indication. So if the urge is genuine, then that person, whether it be it a man or a woman, doesn't have to worry. As there is a law of gravity in the earth and law of causation working in the brain, there is law of love that works at the core of the universe. So when there is an irresistible urge to open up towards the totality, the wholeness, to get into a first-hand touch with it, to get into communion with it, and drink at it, at that source of creation, then a person who gets consumed by that flame of urge, charged with that urge, will find that the mysterious life responds and creates conditions that are agreeable. One doesn't have to worry about that. Till then, one only decides the priorities of life, creates an orderliness on the physical and the mental level and carries on self-education. Skillfully. Without creating a panic in the family in the name of spirituality. Without creating a fuss about it. One has to have a strategy working things out so skillfully and one can do it so that one can dodge the moods of other people dodge the weaknesses of other people and do what one wants to do it's a strategy of love and compassion Now somebody asked me, how did you face the obstacles? Did you face any obstacles? Was that some question? Some personal question, I forget what was it. How did you face it? I wish you had not asked the question because my answer might make you unhappy, that Vimala had that special circumstance or special privilege and we don't have it or we did not have it. My mother's father was a very great friend of Swami Vivekananda. So in the family there was this atmosphere of dedicating life to the exploration of the divine. Even before children were sent to school, the children were taken to Calcutta and to Dakshineshwar, where Ramakrishna Paramhaus and Vivekananda had lived. We were carried there, brought there, and the parents would say, bless our children so that their lives get dedicated to the divine as your life has been. 
So before I was five, I found that my heart was stolen, captured by the divine. The exploration began at the age of five. And the parents cooperated with it. There were obstacles created by society as I grew, especially in India. But instead of having an attitude of confrontation, direct confrontation with the society, their value structure, I just de-recognized all of them. <laughs> I, I hope I am making my meaning clear. You ignore them, you de-recognize them. I did not want to think from the society, those priests, those administrators, those leaders did not want any status, any prestige. When a person does not want anything of man and God, but just the discovery of truth, kindling the light of truth within oneself, then <coughs> No obstacle can hold such a person back. I have tried to be as brief as I could be. Please, will the group leaders tell me if I have missed any of the points of your questions? Pardon? The question of children and education. Children and education? Yes, appropriate education. How to educate the children? Uh, yes, uh, in this world where, where education is really not uh, filled, the institution is not filled with intelligence, how can we educate our children? How can we begin? Yeah. But the women's meeting was not for discussing education today, was it? Well, we are living, whether in America or any other part of the world, we are living in a chaotic world. We are living in an immoral society a corrupt society, a corrupt world. And the educational systems in all the countries, democratic or dictatorial, religious or secular, they deny the opportunity to the children, to the students, to grow in freedom, they do not help the children, they do not enable the children to retain their initiative, their sanity, and their freedom. I hope you are aware of this system. The, the educational systems today are preparing children, bringing them out of universities for a kind of society which is disappearing very fast. Everything is in a melting pot. And the systems have lost their relevance to the present circumstances. So, what can I do? And how do I help my children to grow? What can I do at home? I think I can help my children by surrounding them with affection, care, and concern. Including them in my spiritual investigations and explorations. Not excluding them from that. 
if the children can grow where the parents do not dominate without not without even before they can understand the word freedom they would have had tasted what freedom is with their parents so what can the parents do what can the mother do first thing not to expose the children to the conflicts contradictions the stress and strain between the husband and wife between the man and woman not to expose the children to that you know if you may be angry you may be cross you may be annoyed with each other but if there is a small child say even 3 month old or 4 month old and in the presence of that child the child may be sleeping but if the elders indulge in rough or rude words or behavior verbal aggression or verbal violence it's going to affect the child the nerves and the whole person so we can save the children we are not all saints there would be moods of depression annoyance irritation let us not pretend that because we have begun our inquiries we are suddenly transformed into sages and saints but we can help we can save our children whenever there's such an explosion so that's one thing not conscious domination over them we should not cherish a desire or an ambition that my child my daughter my son will accept my values and live the way i am living this hidden desire because i am not able to convince my husband or my wife i want my child to do what i have not done we want to extend our lives and fulfill our ambitions through children if we don't have that we may not have that economically or politically but if we have that in the name of spirituality i have seen it happen in india so we should be aware of that ambition or desire and help the children to grow in the atmosphere of freedom now one very important point that freedom is not disorderly life freedom has its own discipline it's not a chaotic life it's not a disorderly life to do anything at any time because i wish to do it at that time in that way is not the content of freedom to run after the whims wishes and idiosyncrasies of mind is not the content of freedom as we do not get governed by our impulses <coughs> i think you see that we do not allow the wishes the moods to regulate our behavior so a kind of orderliness is necessary so we have to help the children to grow into discipline please do see this not imposition not domination but helping them to grow with a sense of order and discipline a self restraint and a sense of responsibility if we live that way if there is no disorder in our lives no chaotic behavior in our lives then we can help the children But giving them freedom doesn't mean not educating them or not disciplining them so this is a very subtle there is a very subtle line of demarcation between domination imposition and helping the child to grow with discipline without discipline there can be no learning whatsoever 
without orderliness there can be no pure life order is purity and disorder chaotic life results in many impurities on the physical and mental level so i think we'll have to reconsider the whole issue of what is discipline what is orderliness and how we help our children to grow not in an anarchical way not in a chaotic way but with an order and sense of discipline and self restraint this is very difficult in an affluent country like yours where there is a nauseating proliferation of consumer goods <laughs> we surround our children with those toys and those consumer goods unrelated to their needs in order to express our adoration or our doting upon them we surround them they don't know how to use those things <laughs> and as they grow they grow with a sense of callousness towards these things articles of personal use they'll break those things they'll throw away those things it's a criminal misuse but it is in the lives of the elders all of us so can we prevent our children from becoming victims of the socio economic structure we are victimized can we help the children for not becoming victims of that not puritanism the cult of puritanism and the cult of indulgence they are two extremes and we have to find out the golden mean where there is neither excess no not the excess of in indulgence and no suppression and repression that's a marvelous challenge before those who accept the parenthood because they are the best teachers education begins with them so we don't victimize the children they don't become victims of our moods our annoyances irritations we help them to grow in order freedom there is the security of love and yet the responsibility of orderliness and discipline but i think i should stop we can't uh, indulge in much more elaborations can't go into further details is there any other point that remains to be taken up yes please just comment briefly about uh, dealing with the actual oppression and danger in the world in a kind of open way the truth where there is real fear something to really fear it's very difficult to give you an answer if i would say mothers of the world unite <laughs> <laughs> and say no wars <laughs> bring pressure upon the respective governments of the country that no more production of nuclear weapons the mothers will have to assert themselves but really speaking it is the responsibility of men and women both i was just 
putting it lightly when I said the mothers of the world unite. But it's a world united people's organization. Instead of United Nations organization, if the women could take leadership and bring about a united people's organization, where the people of the world who have started asserting themselves in their respective countries, talking, resisting these nuclear weapons and wars, raising their voice against the violence and wars, if that can be carried a little further, organized on a global scale, and compel the politicians and the administrators to find out decent ways of resolving their problems, and not through these indecent, inhuman ways of resolving every problem with a gun, with killing. The killing that has not helped in the last 3,000 years has still the sanction. Not that the governments are going to listen to you, but can the women get together and raise their voice, persuade the people to remove the sanction from, sanction from behind this arms and ammunitions and mad race. Could the women, say for in USA, bring pressure upon their government that the government will not sail any arms and ammunition to any country in the world. Please do see this. Let them have arms and ammunition for defending the country. But let them not sail arms and ammunition to Vietnam's and Korea's and Israel's and Arab countries and European countries and Pakistan and India. Can we do that? If all the countries, not only women in America, women in India too, everywhere, if the women can say to their government, as a first step towards world peace, you are not going to sail arms and ammunition to any other country. And I think one step is enough for us. Can we do that? A new atmosphere, a new approach to problems will have to be created. We'll have to mobilize the public will. Cultivate the people's will towards focusing our energies on peace and resolutions of problems through other means than the means of killing. If, if that is what you are asking for, I know that everyone here in the USA feels that the nuclear war may be around the corner. I have been asked this question, why meditation when the world is going to be destroyed soon? I was asked that question in Seattle, in Bay Area, in Chile, in Latin America, where I was perhaps hardly 10 days ago. But I have faith in the infinity of life. And I have faith in the urge for survival in the human race. You have asked me a question, what women can do towards it. But the difficulty is, I have not lived in the United States. If the same question were asked in India, where I have lived and I live, then perhaps I could give you more practical suggestions. 
But here I come for a few weeks and leave the country. So it's only general fundamentals that I can deal with. And if I cannot give you more concrete suggestions, I hope you will excuse me and you will appreciate my difficulty. Any other point remains? Uh, yes? Jen? Any other point? Yusuf? Yes? Look, this is a new question now. Mm. I was trying to find out if I have uh, missed any of the points in the questions that we have to take up. It's getting nine-ish now. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us here for sharing your understandings with us. And I'd like us all now to spend the next half hour, there's been so much richness of thoughts, of ideas, of understanding that's been transmitted, that we spend the next half hour in silence so that we can better absorb what has happened for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.